Okay, hello everyone, this is Colin Cox, and in today's audio lecture, we will transition to, and we are in our third and final unit for the semester, the drama unit, where we will read plays, discuss plays, and write about plays. So what I want to do in today's audio, I want to say a few things about how you should think about approaching a play as a text. And I'll come back to that in just a moment, but I also want to spend a bit of time today talking about Trifles by Susan Glaspell, the one act or shorter play that I asked you to read for this week. In subsequent weeks, we will read two longer plays, but today we'll focus on this shorter, more approachable one-act play. But let me take a step back and say a little something about reading and thinking about plays, but doing so in a form that feels a bit counterintuitive. And I say that because unlike poetry and unlike short fiction, two, uh, two ways of reading or two different modalities that can can be collective and communal. You could imagine someone, and this happens quite often, well, at least it did when we would gather in large groups in public doing poetry readings or, or even reading parts and pieces of novels or short stories. While that was certainly something that people did, that we still do and like to do and want to do, reading poetry and reading fiction, it can be, and it's often thought of as an individual activity, something that you do by yourself, independent of a collective or a community. But plays are totally different. The idea of just reading a play and not seeing it staged, not seeing it put on its feet, sounds a bit strange. And again, it might sound a bit counterintuitive. And I'll say a little something about the, the history of plays as texts that people will read and that people have read in just a moment. But I think that's, that's maybe the first thing to keep in mind, is the idea that what we're doing as we're reading these plays is, to some degree, counterintuitive, because plays are often staged for us. Plays are, are if, 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 if we interact, for example, with the literal text itself, we often do so in an academic setting like this. But the goal or the purpose of a play is to do a show, to perform in front of people. So I want you to keep that idea in mind because what it requires you to do as an individual reader is the kind of work that directors and actors would actually do. You need to think of this as not just words on a page, but as something that could be performed, something that is performed, that requires you to do a fair amount of creative thinking. There's a fair amount of interesting creative engagement where you're thinking about what a character might look like, who might you cast in a particular role, how do you think different actors or, or different characters should perform certain lines of dialogue, what should the set look like. All of these components are, are part of this theatrical experience. And again, because we're reading a text and not actually watching a performance, it is incumbent upon you to think theatrically in that way. Because I think something that students can miss if they don't think theatrically are some of the subtleties that emerge by actors or, or through the sorts of performance choices that actors might make, that directors and, and stage directors might make when 
they choose to, to configure a set in a particular way, even thinking about something as subtle as movement or, or voice and vocalization as ways of communicating information. These are all things that you will need to do as you're reading these different plays. And again, I think it's important to at least acknowledge that this, this notion of reading a play independent of seeing a performance. While it's not necessarily a new phenomenon, it is relatively new. And what I mean by that is for the longest time, and now perhaps we're thinking back to the late 16th and early 17th century, the literacy rate in countries like England were relatively low or comparatively low to modern standards. So if you were someone who wanted to experience entertainment, you uh, wouldn't sit down and read a book for, again, a myriad of different reasons. One might be because you uh, couldn't read, or if you could, your literacy abilities were quite limited, but also just the the transmission of books or the circulation of books didn't look like what it looks like today. Books for the longest time were these scarce objects. And again, there's a myriad of reasons why. Literacy rates certainly help to explain why. There just weren't that many books in circulation. But also, for the longest time, actually producing books was a labor-intensive practice. It was extremely hard to do, and it was extremely expensive to do as well. So again, if, if, if you wanted to be entertained, you would probably go to the theater, assuming the theaters were not closed because of, of fears of, of uh, perhaps satanic indoctrination. This is a completely different thing, but it's worth acknowledging that there were certainly periods in England in the 16th and 17th century when the theaters were closed because of, of fear or, or a a kind of, of hysterical fear about what they do to people or what theaters and plays and that kind of entertainment does to people. But during the 16th and 17th century, again, if, if you wanted to experience a play, you would just go to a playhouse and actors would perform it for you. Now, that's not to say that there weren't scripts printed like what we see in our books, but their use and their function was completely different. They were pieces of property that these different acting troops protected because it was their livelihood. So they would be disinclined to print them the way, for example, that we might print Shakespeare's plays or anyone's plays today. They would want to protect those because they were extremely rare commodities that allowed different acting troops to uh, perform and to, in effect, make their livelihood. But all of this started to change in the early to mid 17th century and into the 18th and 19th centuries. But one of the one of the places or or one of the ways you could you could theoretically mark this transition from plays as just something performed on stage that people watched to, to maybe plays as something people would want to read in the privacy of their homes, much like how we would read novels today, started with the publication of the first folio in 1623. Now, the first folio is what we call this big collection of William Shakespeare's plays. And while the first folio was far from the, the first collected work, of an artist of Shakespeare's stature, it is one of the most, and continues to be one of the most significant. But we really saw this shift in the 19th century, again, as literacy rates increased, as, as the novel actually emerged as a literary form in the 
18th century and grew in popularity into the 19th century, this idea of, of reading for oneself in the privacy of one's home, having individual collected works to, to actually read and consume. And again, the, the invention of the printing press a few hundred years earlier certainly helped to uh, increase the, the likelihood that people might buy books because it decreased, it dramatically decreased the, the cost of production and it also increased the, the sheer number of books in circulation. This was around the time that people started actually reading specifically William Shakespeare's plays as a form of entertainment. Now that's not to say plays were not performed or, or people stopped watching them as performances and only read them. That is not true. People still watched plays in the same way that people, in theory, would watch plays today. But I would argue, at least, it's important to note this transition. Again, thinking of plays as, as just these scripts that actors use to construct performances and, and, and thinking of them instead as something that has evolved into legitimate forms of literature that individuals can read in the privacy of their own homes. President Abraham Lincoln, for example, was extremely fond of William Shakespeare, and he had a, as the, as the story or, or perhaps even myth goes, he had this chair, and he would always sit in this chair when he read his Shakespeare. So this, this way of reading plays as, as legitimate forms of literature and not just as, as, again, scripts or materials that actors used to create performances. This is something that slowly built during the 17th, 18th, and 19th century. But I would say as well, it's important to acknowledge that the, the reading of those plays was often supplemented with, or, or you could imagine reading the plays was something of a supplement to actually seeing the performances. And it wasn't until the late 19th and well into the 20th century that plays were treated as texts to be analyzed and used used and thought about in these kinds of academic settings. Now, again, Shakespeare was always used in those terms. Shakespeare, for example, was often included in primers for children, maybe not the entire play or not entire plays, but just excerpts as, as again, forms of edification. Shakespeare was read alongside the Bible as these essential texts to teach people how to be not only educated or well-educated, but it was used to teach certain morals, certain truths about the world, right, wrong, etc. But as, as literary scholarship started to flourish, really, really flourish in a formalized way in the 19th and 20th century, we started to see plays treated as legitimate literary texts to be placed under a kind of academic or analytical consideration independent of seeing a performance or, or, or even, again, flipping or inverting what I said before about how the, the performance was primary and the text was secondary. Now, when plays are often taught in academic settings, the text is primary and a teacher or a professor might show certain scenes maybe on YouTube as a way of supplementing the reading and the analysis of, of the text in question. So I just wanted to briefly trace that history of plays as, as texts, how we've used them in different cultural contexts and how we use them and think about them today. So again, before I transition to talk about trifles, I just wanted to, to reiterate the importance of thinking theatrically and to remind you of the work that you need to do to uh, 
actually visualize the text because we're not watching performances in addition to reading the plays themselves. You will not, like you might have in a short story or a novel, a narrator who will meticulously describe settings for you. You will need to supplement. But I would like to say that's one of the reasons why I like reading plays so much because unlike a novel or a short story, again, often novels and short stories, the, the settings, the narrator will meticulously describe those settings for us. There's far less of that with plays. You as the reader are perhaps emboldened to construct this world with the parts and pieces the playwright gives you. And again, often, and, and this is something, you don't see it so much with modern playwrights. And, and I know thinking about Glaspell as a modern playwright might seem a bit strange, but she is, she is modern relative to someone, again, like William Shakespeare, who died in 1616. But if you read his plays, what you'll notice is there's, there's just a, a dearth of stage directions, which is to say there's really no stage directions at all. There's, there's no indication that the set should look a particular way. You as, as the reader are, are again, you're, you're almost deputized to make those choices. But I, I think, I think that, that still exists, even with some of these more modern plays that have more stage directions, more instructions for you, uh, either the reader, the director, the actor, for how you should think about a character, conceptualize a character, think about and conceptualize a space, etc. But but that's that's the thing that I really like is is how you have so much power here to make this scene or this setting for whatever play it is look however you want it to look. And all of the things we've talked about in the poetry unit an attention to uh, language, really picking language apart, trying to understand its significance to uh, the development of themes, and, and even into the short fiction unit where, where we, we used a lot of those skills and techniques, thinking about characters, characterization, plot, narrative, because all of that, all of that exists in plays. I would even go as far as to say, if you think about the trajectory of this semester where we started with poetry and the focus was far less on narrative and far less on the characteristics of storytelling to short fiction where we, we certainly prioritized narrative voice, storytelling, point of view, etc. I, I think you could almost argue drama or plays is a combination of those two. We really need to use all of the skills we've developed in the previous two units to uh, successfully read and analyze and think about a play. Again, whether it's a longer play or one of these shorter one-act plays. So, okay, with all that said, let's transition to uh, Trifles by Susan Glaspell. So what's really interesting about a play like Trifles is if you look at the character list and even if you just read the opening stage directions and maybe even the first page of dialogue, you would probably never think or conclude that as a genre piece, this is more like a detective procedural play than it is anything else because the, the central piece of this story, of this narrative that drives the action is this question, did this person, in fact, murder her husband or not? And the, the characters that we might think 
are in fact the, the detectives or the ones who function as the detectives in fact are not. It's not the men of the play who discover the truth. They're not the ones who are actually capable of deducing the truth. It's actually their wives. And this is, I think, one of the most important things to consider when thinking about plays. And I think it's relevant when thinking about fiction and short fiction, but location and how location and space certainly creates interesting possibilities. Because one of the reasons why, and I think this is one of the more delightful bits of irony about the play, one of the reasons why the men in the play cannot deduce the truth of what happened is because all of the evidence resides in this deeply, deeply gendered space, which is to say all of the evidence exists in the kitchen. All of the evidence, a space that for the longest time was occupied exclusively by women. It's a space they know. It's a space they understand. There are certain subtleties about that space that these two wives are able to see and deduce that their husbands and this attorney simply are not. So I think in that way, Glasspool is is quite aware of the importance of space and location, and in particular, and I think in this way, you could probably draw some similarities between a writer like Alice Munro and Susan Glaspell. They're both deeply interested in how spaces are gendered and how spaces were gendered. And even though we're certainly in a different cultural space, how there are still certain types of assumptions that we associate with different spaces. And again, how we far too often gender certain spaces. So I think what I would like to do is actually just work chronologically through the play, and I will highlight and identify certain moments and passages that I think are important. I'll read directly from the text and offer a bit of commentary. And then at the end, I'll say a little bit, just in summation, just some final thoughts. And one of the places that I always like to start when I read or study a play is with the opening stage directions. Now, again, I mentioned this earlier, depending on when a play was written, depending on the particular cultural and aesthetic sensibilities. Some plays may have a lot of information at the beginning, a lot of stage directions, or very few. Again, for example, it is quite predictable to uh, pick up one of William Shakespeare's plays and to expect to receive very few stage directions at the beginning or even throughout the play. Whereas if you were to read one of Tennessee Williams's plays, for example, A Streetcar Named Desire, you'll read, I would need to double check, but you'll read something approximate to a couple of pages of stage directions before the play proper begins. So again, depending on the cultural and aesthetic sensibilities, you might get a lot of information at the beginning in the form of stage directions or very little information. And you can almost think of these stage directions as, as language directly from the author. It's often used to help a director, if they wanted to stage the play, create a set or a setting. But let's actually start here, and this is on page 1197. So the scene opens, the kitchen in the now abandoned farmhouse of John Wright, a gloomy kitchen and left without having been put in order, unwashed pans under the sink, a loaf of bread outside the bread box, a dish towel on the table, other signs of incompleted work. And I would almost highlight that word work. At the rear, the outer door opens and the sheriff comes in, followed by the county attorney and Hale. The sheriff and Hell are men in middle age, excuse me, in middle life. The county attorney is a young man. All are much bundled up and go at once to the stove. They are followed by the two women. The sheriff's wife first. She is a slight, wiry woman, a thin, nervous face. Mrs. Hill is large and would ordinarily be called more comfortable looking but she is disturbed now and looks fearful about as she enters. The women have come in slowly 
and stand close together near the door. So one of the first things that Glassbill wants to bring to our attention, especially if we were watching this play, watching a performance of this play, is this sense that the kitchen itself, and this is something that the characters will make reference to, they will comment on this, the way the, the kitchen seems unfinished or, or the work that, that one might expect someone to do to properly tend to and clean a kitchen, that work was left unfinished, presumably by Mrs. Wright, the wife, the lady of the house. So even here at the beginning, there is this sense, there is this subtle notion or allusion to the idea that Mrs. Wright was either a complacent wife who did not want to perhaps do what was expected of her in a domestic space, or she became complacent. Something happened, perhaps over time. And I think, again, like a good detective story, like a good mystery, the opening doesn't answer any of these questions for us. It simply encourages us to ask certain questions. And again, a lot of these questions, if not all of them, Glaspell will answer by the end of the play, but I want to bring to your attention just how many questions the play establishes here at the beginning. I would also bring to your attention how Mrs. Hale in particular seems, according to the text, uncomfortable, or or she, she has the appearance of someone who should be comfortable, but she seems disturbed, and she almost has or possesses this fearfulness. Now, again, I think the question worth asking, and this is something that we wouldn't, if we were watching this play, for example, this is not something that we would read, but this is certainly something a competent and capable actor would communicate to us through performance. But again, I think the question worth asking, and it is answered by the end of the play, is why is Mrs. Hale so uncomfortable entering this space. What, presumably, does she know or suspect that the other characters don't, in particular the male characters, who don't seem to have any feelings about entering this space? If anything, they appear neutral or or disinterested. They they don't seem to be either excited or frightful. They, they seem to emote nothing. But the two female characters are doing a lot of emoting. I think this is important because if you wanted to think about character development in this play, I think, regrettably, the male characters are left so poorly developed and I think that's part of the point. And by contrast, the female characters, even the female character we don't see, the one, again, whose choices and actions dictate and determine the narrative of this story, they are all far more developed and, and actually have character arcs and they shift and change and evolve in ways that these male characters don't. So I think in that respect, Trifles is a female-centric and female-driven play. Ironically enough, the male characters are nothing more than window dressing. And one of the places that I want to start is, is actually with this, this characterization of Mrs. Wright. Again, one of the most important characters in the play, even though we never see or hear from her directly, at least. And again, this is something, if you think about genre, that's that's not too uncommon. If you're someone who likes certain detective shows, detective procedurals, you'll know that often the, the person who dies at the beginning we learn very little about them while they're alive or, or while they actually have a direct or visible presence in the episode. It's only later in the episode or throughout the episode after they've died or, or after they're not present that we start to learn things about them. And if you're, for example, someone who likes the television series Twin Peaks, you might know that Laura Palmer is one of the most important characters in the show even though we never learn very much, if anything at all, directly about Laura. Everything we learn is 
indirect. It's secondhand because Laura, of course, she she arrives dead in the pilot episode within the first couple of minutes. So this is not, again, if we're thinking about genre, this is not something so uncommon. Even though Mrs. Wright is not dead, the point I'm trying to make is this is very much a play about her, even though, ironically enough, she is never present, she does not have a direct voice, everything we learn about her, we learn it indirectly. And we have a great example of this on page 1199. And this is Hale who's communicating this moment recently when he interacted with her. And again, notice how his description and characterization of her doesn't really provide a lot of answers. It just creates more questions. So I'm reading directly from the text. I said, how do, Mrs. Wright? It's cold, ain't it? And she said, is it? And went on kind of pleading at her apron. Well, I was surprised. She didn't ask me to come up to the stove or to sit down, but just sat there, not even looking at me. So I said, I want to see John. And then she laughed. I guess you would call it a laugh. I thought of Harry and the team outside. So I said, a little sharp, can't I see John? No, she said. Kind of dull-like? Ain't he home? Says I. Yes, she says. He's home. Then why can't I see him? I asked her, out of patience. Cause he's dead, says she. Dead, says I. She just nodded her head, not getting a bit excited, but rocking back and forth. Why, where is he? Says I, not knowing what to say. She just pointed upstairs, like that, himself pointing to the room above. I got up with the idea of going up there. I walked from there to here. Then I say, why, what did he die of? He died of a rope round his neck, says she, and just went on, pleating at her apron. Well, I went out and called Harry. I thought I might need help. We went upstairs, and there he was, lying. So, a couple of things here. First, again, Notice how, according to Hill's description, Mrs. Wright seems completely unhinged, and I think it's important. I talked about this in the poetry unit and definitely in the short fiction unit, that we should always be skeptical of these kinds of indirect characterizations where characters are not afforded an opportunity to speak for themselves. Not that, and I think this caveat's important, not that I think Mrs. Hale could, could if afforded an opportunity, accurately describe or convey her feelings or emotions, at least necessarily. I think there's always a, a gap in self-knowledge. I think we we often think we know far more about ourselves than we actually do. But, but that aside, I think it's interesting how his description of her renders her completely and utterly unhinged. But I would encourage you to pay attention to some of these more subtle moments, in particular, the way Glaspell effectively and successfully incorporates moments of rather morbid and macabre humor. All of these, all of this, this fun back and forth. It almost feels like cat and mouse. Again, even though the setting wouldn't necessarily remind you of a detective story, this, this feels like a detective story. It almost feels like a noir story in a lot of ways, just set in a more rural and country and, and perhaps backwater setting. But I think, again, in particular, when thinking about what this bit of dialogue does for our understanding of Mrs. Wright, she seems detached. She seems morbidly funny. She she even seems a bit petulant, like like she's protesting a little bit at, at, at even the absurdity of these questions. So I think that is an interesting place to start when thinking about Mrs. Wright as a character, because I think it has the effect of potentially influencing the way we think about her. And this is something, again, that you see often in detective fiction and the kinds of procedural dramas that are quite popular on network television. The way we think about a character, in particular a victim, at the beginning of an episode usually shifts and changes throughout the episode as we learn more information about them, and that is certainly something that happens in this play too.
But this is not the only bit of exposition we receive about Mrs. Wright, because we also learn or we receive something of a counter narrative from Mrs. Hill, and this is on page 1202. So this is an exchange between Mrs. Hill and Mrs. Peters. And again, I think what's interesting about this is how it's, it's something of a counter narrative to the way Hale described Mrs. Wright earlier in the play. Mrs. Hale, she's speaking now, examining the skirt. Wright was close. I think maybe that's why she kept so much to herself. She didn't even belong to the lady's aid. I suppose she felt she couldn't do her part, and then you don't enjoy things when you feel shabby. She used to wear pretty clothes and be lively when she was Minnie Foster, one of the town girls singing in the choir. But that, oh, that was 30 years ago. This all you was to take in. She said she wanted an apron. Funny thing to want, for there isn't much to get you dirty in jail, goodness knows. But I suppose just to make her feel more natural. She said... They was in the top drawer, in this cupboard, yes, here, and then her little shawl that always hung behind the door, opens, stare, door, and looks, yes, here it is, quickly shuts door leading upstairs, abruptly moving toward her. Mrs. Peters? Yes, Mrs. Hale. Do you think she did it? In a frightened voice. Oh, I don't know. Well, I don't think she did asking for an apron and her little shawl, worrying about her fruit. So a couple of important things here. The first, we we learn from Mrs. Hale in particular, and, and, and this is something that you could probably just deduce from watching the play, but a lot of time has transpired in this little country town. These people have been married to one another for quite some time, but Mrs. Hale communicates how who Mrs. Wright was long ago, decades ago, when she was Minnie Foster. There seems to be something incongruous with who that person was and who she is now, or what her behavior and what her environment would seem to suggest about who she is now. And I think, obviously, what, what the play wants to do or suggest is Mr. Wright was such a controlling and tyrannical force that he he seemed to just suck all the life out of her. But I think this is important because it offers a useful counter narrative. She does not, for example, Mrs. Hill does not imply, well, you know, she's always been this odd, eccentric person. No, in fact, she says the complete opposite, that who she is now and what she is now and what she's become, this has been a slow progression. This has been a, a kind of, of digression in some way. And, and for that, I think there is this obvious sense of tragedy, which the characters will talk about later in the play, perhaps not unifying together, not remaining connected and, and functioning as a kind of support group for one another. But again, I think receiving this counter-narrative about Mrs. Wright is so important because it introduces yet another question. If Mrs. Hale is correct, if her characterization of who Mrs. Wright was is correct, then what caused her to... Uh, regress or or what's the what's the cause what's the culprit what's the explanation for this depressive regression but what i also think this exchange does it establishes the terms for the character development that happens in this rather short play and the focus here is not on mrs wright or mrs hale but it's actually with mrs peters and i think this is so important that she is uncertain if Mrs. Wright did what she's accused of doing. And we, we see that Mrs. Hale doesn't actually think she did it at all. And I, I think, to, to be fair, perhaps there's a bit of character development with Mrs. Hale as well. She has an arc. But I think the more substantial arc and the more satisfying arc actually happens with Mrs. Peters. And it's this moment near the end of the play, I'll read it directly from the play, when someone says something to the effect that because she's the sheriff's wife, it's it's, it's as if she's married to 
the law. But what we see at the end is, is her defiance in the face of that law. And I think that's, that's an important moment for this character, and it signifies an important bit of growth. And it also reflects just the, the robust arc that this character has in this play, even though, again, this is a rather short play. Now, from here, something really interesting happens in the play where the men go upstairs, and I think there's an interesting assumption that happens here, and, and they they leave their wives to just remain in the kitchen to wait for them. And, and the interesting assumption that I think that, that happens here is this sense or this notion that if we want to deduce the particulars of the crime, we must go directly to the crime scene. That is, that is where we will learn the truth. But this is a play that argues the complete opposite, in fact. If you want to learn the truth about the crime, you don't need to look to the crime scene. You need to look elsewhere. Maybe in a place, and I mentioned this earlier, where these men would not look, a place that they would perhaps think is not the sort of place to, to uncover the truth about a crime of this nature, and it's in the kitchen. It's in this space that Mrs. Wright occupied, and almost immediately after the men leave, I think this is so important, notice what Mrs. Hale notices, and this is on page 1203 near the bottom of the page. Mrs. Peters, look at this one. Here, this is the one she was working on. And look at the sewing. All the rest of it has been so nice and even. And look at this. It's all over the place. Why, it looks as if she didn't know what she was about. After she has said this, they look at each other, then start to glance back at the door. After an instant, Mrs. Hill has pulled at a knot and ripped the sewing. Oh, what are you doing, Mrs. Hill? mildly, just pulling out a stitch or two that's not sewed very good, threading the needle. Bad sewing always made me fidgety. So here, what we see happen, this is the kind of thing you would actually see in a Sherlock Holmes story, where for Holmes to uh, know the truth about what happened he would not move or, or go perhaps directly to or exclusively to the crime scene he would want to see what the culprit's living space looked like and, and in particular, to, to perhaps look for or search for any inconsistencies, any anomalies, which is exactly what Mrs. Hill finds. This anomaly or this inconsistency in the sewing pattern suggests a kind of rupture or disruption. But, but in addition to finding what one could argue is evidence that something happened, that something was wrong. Notice what she does. She undoes it. I think if we wanted to use contemporary parlance, we would probably say she has tampered with evidence. And the question worth asking is, why has she done this? And I think for a character like Mrs. Hale, it's because, and, and this, this perhaps relates back to something I said about the beginning, the way she seems as she entered this space. This seems to suggest or imply that she suspected that Mrs. Wright did, in fact, murder her husband. And her goal and her objective here is not to find evidence to support that claim, but instead to find evidence and then hide or bury said evidence, perhaps, as an act of solidarity, perhaps because of what we learn later about the guilt she feels be because she does, in fact, feel guilty about leaving Mrs. Wright just in this place, disconnected from anyone else, living with, if we are to believe the descriptions of Mr. Wright, this, this tyrannical husband. So here, again, notice the subtlety of what happens in this scene or sequence. There's so much that these characters say without directly saying it. But in addition to this bit of, of sewing that they find that has this obvious rupture in it, there's another piece of potential evidence that they find. And this is on page pages 1204, 1205, and, and even on to 1206. I would encourage you to read these pages again, because this is where Mrs. Hale confesses 
her guilt about not perhaps forging a better friendship with Mrs. Wright. But here on page 1205, they actually discover this bird, and I'll read directly from the text. It's the bird jumping up. But, Mrs. Peters, look at it. It's neck. Look at its neck. It's all other side to. Somebody wrung its neck. Their eyes met a look of growing comprehension, of horror. Steps are heard outside. Mrs. Hale slips box under quilt pieces and sinks into her chair. Enter sheriff and county attorney. Mrs. Peters rises as one turning from serious things to little pleasantries. Well, ladies, have you decided whether she was going to quilt it or knot it? We think she was going to knot it. Well, that's interesting, I'm sure. So the first thing, obviously, this county attorney, he's so incredibly patronizing, even though, and, and this is, A wonderful moment of dramatic irony, which is to say this is a wonderful moment where we, the audience, know something one of the characters does not. They just received unambiguous confirmation, it seems, of what actually happened here. And the reason why the bird matters is because, and again, you'll you'll notice even, even something akin to a kind of parallelism where Mr. Wright strangled this bird, which I think you could argue the bird, it's it's representative perhaps of Mrs. Wright. It's something, it's something delicate. It's 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 something it's something that's perhaps so easy to harm and hurt, but in return, in retaliation, you could argue that she, quote, wrung his neck as well. So again, I think there's almost a kind of dramatic parallelism happening here where what's what's happened to the bird, that very thing happens to Mr. Wright. But again, notice how these two women, in particular at this point, Mrs. Hill, is deeply committed to either tampering with evidence or hiding evidence. Perhaps, again, as a reflection of this guilt she feels, perhaps she feels as though her action or or her inaction put Mrs. Wright in a position to do what she did, or perhaps she's just doing it as an act of solidarity. This is a woman who, if, if these men find this evidence, this is a woman who the criminal justice system will probably not treat very fairly. There will not be a lot of understanding. There will not, for example, be any acknowledgement of today what we would perhaps call domestic abuse, domestic assault, psychological manipulation, gaslighting, etc. None of that will exist in the proceedings. All that the court will perhaps consider is the simple fact that she murdered him. And and in that way, you could almost imagine this gesture by Mrs. Hill as an act of solidarity. And I think to further understand or, or to better develop this notion that Mrs. Hale in particular and later Mrs. Peters are, are interested in this kind of solidarity, I think to get a sense of this, we should go to page 1206 because I think, I think this is something that, that these two women speak to in a rather compelling way. So again, this is on page 1206 with rising voice. We don't know who killed him. We don't know her own feeling not interrupted. If there's been years and years of nothing, then a bird to sing to you. It would be awful. Still, after the bird was still, something within her speaking, I know what stillness is. When we homesteaded in Dakota and my first baby died after he was two years old and me with no other then moving, How soon do you suppose they'll be through looking for the evidence? I know what stillness is, pulling herself back. The law has got to punish crime, Mrs. Hale. 
So here, I think you could argue Mrs. Peters, she's still perhaps wavering or waffling a bit, but I think this notion of stillness, and if we wanted to think, because maybe this this word for us today lacks any real precision, I think considering what she said about being on a homestead in Dakota and her first baby died, and, and perhaps if we wanted to imagine that a good synonym for a word like stillness is perhaps loneliness and isolation. I think we're we're getting a sense of what this this kind of female solidarity looks like for someone like Glaspell and how for so many women, for far too many women, for far too long, they just felt this overwhelming sense of isolation. There's a remarkable amount of social science research, for example. If you want to think about, and, and this is well into the future, at least when thinking about when this play was written, but again, there's a, there's a significant amount of social science research and scholarship that suggests one of the reasons why we have this idea or this notion that women are highly verbally communicative, that they like to share, and men, by contrast, do not, is because for far too long, there were these expectations about what work looked like for men and women. If you think, for example, about the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, and even into the 1970s, this idea that the home was a decidedly feminine space, that the domestic space was the domain of the wife, and by contrast, the husband or the man left the home. If you just think about the amount of socialization or the lack of socialization that women experience just from one day to the next, by contrast to their husbands who spent all day in public around people, that is a far more compelling explanation for why, why women are often thought of or why they were often thought of as, as highly communicative verbally and men were not. It's, it's just simply because they were not in a space where they could communicate or interact with a lot of people and, and men, by contrast, were. So again, I, I think if, if we want to have a better understanding of what this word stillness means, I often think of a word like loneliness or isolation. But even though Mrs. Peters says the law has got to punish crime, Mrs. Hale, it doesn't take her long to perhaps change or, or modify her feelings about this. I'll continue reading here on 1206. I wish you'd seen Minnie Foster when she wore a white dress with blue ribbons and stood up there in the choir and sang, Oh, I wish I'd come over here once in a while. That was a crime. That was a crime. Who's going to punish that? We mustn't take on. I might have known she needed help. I know how things can be for women. I tell you, it's queer, Mrs. Peters. We live close together and we live far apart. We all go through the same things. It's just, excuse me, it's all just a different kind of the same thing. If I was you, I wouldn't tell her her fruit was gone. Tell her it ain't. Tell her it's all right. Take this in to prove it to her. She, she may never know whether it was broke or not. My, it's a good thing that men couldn't hear us. Wouldn't they just laugh? Getting all stirred up over a little thing like a dead canary, as if that could have anything to do with, with, wouldn't they laugh? So, I think here, again, we're getting a sense of, of what really defines these characters. I think for Mrs. Hale, it's this notion of, or this sense of regret, but also this, this notion, this, this irony, this something, and, and, and even though this play is as old as it is, I think this is what resonates for so many readers today. It's this line she says when she says, we all go through the same things 
It's all just a different kind of the same thing. This is, I think, an idea, and, and even that notion that we're so close, but we're so far apart. I think this is one of those moments when the play wants to speak to, to these, these more universal themes. And perhaps you could argue for a character like Mrs. Peters. Part of, of her character arc is this realization or this understanding or this deeper sense of, of the, the tragedy that is Mrs. Wright's life. And in particular, the limited options available to her, not just in this moment, but the limitations that she experienced throughout her life. And I think the point is, the point, I suppose, that I'm driving toward, and I've said this before, is I think this is a play that tries to dramatize what female solidarity, especially in a patriarchal society and system, can and should look like. Because I think what we see in this play are these two women who... Uh, traverse this divide that exists between them and the thing that really unites them seems to be even though the play ends in a in a potentially precarious spot maybe it doesn't but i think the thing that really unites them is this shared commitment to protecting mrs wright again this character and and this character whose actions are so important to this play yet we never actually see her so I guess the things that I want to say uh, in summation here at the end, I've talked about a lot of this. I think this is a play that tries to uh, dramatize the differences between what men and women see. I think this is a play that wants to show and explore how spaces are so important and how if we want to know the truth about any particular situation, whether it's a potential murder case or not, we should really pay attention to the spaces that the people involved occupy. And we should also think about and reflect on our own biases and how those biases might cause us to ignore important pieces of information that might reveal certain truths about these, these individuals in question. And in this play, it's a character like Mrs. Right, But again, I think this is also a play that is deeply, deeply committed to dramatizing what female solidarity looks like, and perhaps even upon reflection, what it doesn't look like. So I think, again, in that way, this is, you could argue, a deeply and unmistakably feminist play. So, okay, I don't think there's anything else I want to say because I'm almost at the one hour mark. If you have any questions, please contact me, but I hope you have a wonderful week and I'll talk to you next week.